Hello and welcome to the Homeless Consultant channel. My name is Paul B. I am the Homeless Consultant. And it is now day 24 since I had a shower or a shave with no end in sight thanks to Governor Tim Waltz's stay at home order. So what I'm going to do is finish up my series on Computer Models 101 for government officials in the hopes that perhaps uh, certain government officials will put on their thinking caps and realize that this isn't the healthiest situation in the world. Um, but for the rest of you, I hope you'll start to understand exactly what's going on with these computer models. I've got a ton of stuff to put in this one. I almost split it into four parts. I'm doing my best to keep it brief. Let's just hit it right away, okay? Let's just get going here. First thing I need to do is to briefly recap what I went over in the first two videos. And that is just, of course, to kind of refresh your memory briefly. So basically, I, in part one, I talked about the definition of a model. What is a model? It's a representation or an abstraction of something that is real or in your imagination. It is subject to perception. It is subject to interpretation. In the more benign cases, they are meant to take your imagination on a journey. And as science and math have improved over the past you know, couple centuries in particular, models have taken on the at least the potential to be much more useful and functional. In many cases, they very much are. Uh, I gave some examples in terms of the code breakers in World War II and how a computer might assist with that, but in the end, what we ended up with was that computers are able to compute much faster than humans. They're, they're not a model of the human brain. They're almost the opposite of a human brain, the way that they function. We do not compute, do mathematic equations and such very quickly. Computers do it very quickly, but we think and we think just like that and computers cannot even think at all let alone fast so don't let anybody tell you that a computer is like a fast human brain they are complete completely different uh, along those lines I went into artificial intelligence a little bit just to kinda of whet your appetite for that and give you a, a couple examples of why computers will never ever be able to think they'll certainly never be able to have the human experience they're not humans they're computers they're tools just like a hammer or a chisel I talked about the Turing test which is how you determine whether a computer can simulate a human effectively or not and I talked about Plato's allegory of the cave and how even back then 2500 years ago or so he was looking at his fellow man walking around basically the equivalent of staring at a cell phone all day just oblivious to the whole universe that's going around them that is going to be very important as we move on looking at predictive computer models um, also I, I talked a bit more about cults which is number one on my existential threats to America list and it's number one for a reason cults dumb people down to the lowest common denominator it forces them to let thinking and rational thought processing of, of cleansed information go in favor of these rules of thumb you're black therefore you're inferior you're Jewish therefore you're inferior you're homeless therefore you're a threat in part two I went over the guitar modeling hardware or software that I have and I showed you I, I talked you through how the computer how the programmer can simulate a guitar amplifiers and effects and do it so well so well those are simulations and I took that a bit further to flight simulators racing simulators and things like that um, and they do a wonderful job but there's a reason for that go back to part two for the details um, I showed you the couple of methods you can use to make that happen the brute force or physical modeling of real world items um, I also showed how they the, the main purposes of those is training entertainment and they can also in some cases be used for post-mortem investigations if a plane crash you can plug the black box data in there to backtrack and see how the plane functioned or the train or whatever vehicle it was how it um, functioned right before the accident happened um, also with the space shuttle remember all the debris field and this is going to be important I'm going to bring this up at the end of this uh, episode 
when the debris field fell on the ground, they mapped out physically where those were and they backtracked and that's what helped them get some more data from the computer model to add to the other data that the thinking humans were using to figure out why the shuttle Columbia disintegrated. Um, remember that maximum overdrive movie, we made you, we made these tools, these computers, they didn't make us. Only in science fiction do they take over, like the Terminator. Okay, um, so let's go over just the seven key points from that really quick from, from the previous two episodes here. Computers are not the spectacular, mind-blowing, space-aged thinking machines that you think they are. They cannot perform miracles. They compute really, really fast. That's about it. Period. They are merely tools that allow uh, to follow programmed instructions. The instructions are programmed by human beings. Uh, they can be programmed to simulate thinking but they're not very good at it. And in fact, they're not good at it at all. And they cannot think. They can only compute. Second thing is the humans who program these computers are flawed. Some of them are highly flawed. Some of them are walking disaster areas. They have biases. They have prejudices. They have self-interest. They have agendas. There's all kinds of things that can get in the way of when they sneak in and start programming a computer. The computer, which you think is some kind of independent objective result, is actually just an extension of what's going on in their twisted minds. Remember that. Remember that. Any errors that are in the program code when you're writing out the computer program, any errors in the code itself, or any mathematical errors, you put in a mathematical equation and you make an error, you put in an X instead of a Y, anything like that, even one instance of it in a huge program with thousands of lines of code, can completely disturb your results. It may have no effect, it may have a small effect, it may have a large effect, or it could even have a catastrophic effect on the quality of the results. The computer cannot tell you if there are any errors in the program or in the data. The computer has no way to know. It can't think. So even if you, it's garbage in, garbage out. I can't believe I never mentioned that in the last two videos. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put in errors or if you put in bad data, it's going to crunch it just as if it were good data and it's going to spit out a result to you. Computer models do not produce answers. You do not just plug in a bunch of stuff into a computer and it will tell you what happened in the real world or what's going to happen in the real world, the details of it. As with the shuttle, the best it could do with all that information it had was give you basically a, a flight simulator showing what happened and when things fell off. Human beings had to do the work. They had to do the CSI kind of stuff to go find out what really happened. And that's always the case, including with a pandemic. Um, the results must be interpreted. The results that these computers do give you, they have to be interpreted by the same flawed, sometimes very flawed, sometimes walking disaster areas who program the computers. So you have a lot of levels where there could be errors or just Again, I'm, I have to use the phrase, it's the only one that works. Human stupidity that is interfering with the output of this computer from start to finish. And you might have a million dollars put into building this computer model over, over the years. You know, one of the main um, basic models for disease methods was, goes back to like 1927 or something. I mean, can you imagine all the resources and time and money that's been spent on honing that thing over the decades? And after all that, it could produce absolute garbage for an answer. It could. It might, well, we'll look at that later. And the last thing is government leaders make decisions. They, they have to make a decision. If you're going to be a leader, you have to make a decision whether to put your trust, which is the well-being of all the people who you are charged to serve, are you going to put your trust, which is essentially a religious faith, in this cult of science? when push comes to shove or are you gonna think independently because if you're a government official a government leader if you don't understand the problem with computer models especially predictive ones you're taking a big big gamble with a lot of people's lives alright so that's the first thing I want to mention 
Okay, the second thing I want to go over here is very briefly, I put it in my last video, which was basically asking you to go to Twitter and to look up hashtag liberate Minnesota. There was a protest. Finally, some people took some stands for what is right. They showed some human dignity and they went down to the uh, state capitol in Minnesota and demanded their freedom back and end to this ridiculous stay at home order. Now, how much they understood about the problem with computer models, that I don't know, but at least they were thinking constitutionally. They were thinking in terms of the way our founding fathers did, and the people in those generations dealt with disease and epidemics as well, so they knew what they were doing. Now, here's the thing. My predictions of what a computer cannot do, I, I can do, for example, because you're thinking, and so can you. Now, since I have studied things like anti-smoking for, you know, 30 years, the way that people who don't think very well, who just believe whatever they're told, but the experts tell them, and they blindly just suck it in, they listen to NPR all day long, they're just immersed in this culture of, of experts telling you everything. They have a pretty standard response, a way of speaking to people. And it is so dissociated from reality that you, you cannot look at them yet you have to look at them as if they're either from another planet or they have literally gone insane and this is very very different than just someone who has a different opinion or an opinion you disagree with I'm a Christian if I debate a Muslim wow they really believe what they believe in and they might have a lot of knowledge and we can have a great debate remember what I said in my junk science videos when I debate somebody over religion we can get done and hug and shake hands and have a wonderful time together because we're both seeking the truth but when you get into junk science you don't get anything of the kind you barely open your mouth and once you identify yourself as having a different opinion than these people they just fly off the handle and go berserk they're not capable of debating because they don't know how to think Plato's allegory of the cave and Today, that's the equivalent of people who are just sitting there watching, you know, listening to NPR, watching CNN, staring at their phones. They, the whole universe of possibilities is all around them, and they just zero in. So I predicted that um, these people were, you know, the way that they're going to speak is going to be the, exactly the same as the way the anti-smokers have always spoken. Now, you can go back 30 years. I can't present it to you because it's all in storage right now of course, but um, if you go back 30 years or just do some research on the net if you can go back that far, the way that these virulent anti-smokers, the people who think that smokers are killing everybody because they don't know anything about what they're even talking about, they're just regurgitating what they've been told, those people because they can't formulate an argument, because they have no basis for their beliefs in the first place, they go off the handle really easy. And they always say things like, you know, you're killing everybody, you're putting everyone's life at risk. You know, how are you, and emotional things like, how are you going to feel when you're, when you're, you know, your wife or your husband sitting in the hospital with a tube in their throat and, and they just go on with, these are not arguments, these are not rational arguments, these are just people grasping for anything they can say that sounds like it's supporting what they believe because they don't even understand why they believe. Here's one of these Twitter's tweets. This is from the head of the Democratic Party in, in Minnesota. How sad. Over 800 Minnesotans willfully ignored sh the shelter-in-place order today, putting their health and the health of their friends, neighbors, and loved ones at risk. Okay, that's not an argument. First of all, 800 Minnesotans. I heard it was 500, but I don't know, whatever. Um, I have been showing you all along throughout the stay-at-home order how nobody's paying attention to the stay-at-home order. And friends, if anybody is paying attention to it, from what I can tell, it is the people who are doing the protesting. The kinds of people I see out and about are a lot more leaning toward the left, shall we say. And I've documented that already in these videos. Um... Look at how they phrase it. They're, the, what, what they're saying that the person's doing, all these people, what they're actually doing is willfully putting their health and the health of their friends, neighbors, and loved ones at risk. That's what they're doing. That's the way they frame it. What, what do the people who are organizing this and going to the protests say that they're doing? They are doing exactly what their ancestors did. That's why we have freedom today, because of what our ancestors did. They are out standing up for their freedom, standing up for the Constitution. They are fighting against tyranny, and they are fighting against a governor who calls himself a leader while he's doing nothing but following these experts who don't know what they're doing. 
and this the Twitter thing was just full of these people who can't make a, a rational argument to save their lives. All they can do they're using words like dumb, stupid, moron all the time. That's all they do. And when they say stupid, they don't mean it in an academic sense like I do. They just it's just an insult. You ask them to define what stupidity is, and they they wouldn't be able to. Now I don't want to get bogged down on this at this point. Um, I wish I could go over these more because the way that these tweets are written are a carbon copies of what I have in storage from anti-smokers over the last 30 years, going back to when, again, they were just news groups. They didn't have, even have the World Wide Web yet. The way they speak is the same. Now, the thing is, what I was getting at was that I predicted that that's how these kinds of people, the non-thinking people, how they were going to respond to things like a protest or to somebody standing up for what is right. And the reason is because I have 30 years of experience understanding how these kinds of people present themselves publicly because they don't have a basis for what they believe. And what do you know? They're, they're almost word for word. You could almost replace uh, you know, stay-at-home order or coronavirus with tobacco. And, of course, in between, we've had things like climate change. It's the exact same thing. Just replace smoking with climate change. These people do the same thing over and over and over. Uh, who is going to liberate all of you red-hatted dumbbells when you all start dropping like flies from a highly contagious virus? Will you apologize to Grandma as she lies dying due to your selfishness and ignorance? Ah, ignorance. Or is she just collateral damage? That's not a rational argument, folks. That's name-calling. It's vicious. R look at my junk science videos. Videos number two and three, I talk about how to identify a junk scientist. What this person said right here is exactly out of episodes one and or two and three. How to identify a junk scientist. That is almost word for word. They even threw in a little extra for us, the red-hatted part. They made it about Donald Trump. These people have this Trump derangement syndrome. This is worse than the allegory of the cave. At least the allegory of the cave, these people were relatively stable within the context of staring at this wall with the universe going around. These people are insane. We cannot trust our futures and our, our well-being to these people. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to look at a <clears throat> predictive model that you're more familiar with. I'm going to see how successful it was. I'm going to look at hurricane predictions very, very briefly. Specifically, I'm going to look at Hurricane Irma. Okay, so let's take that brief look at Hurricane Irma. That was the big hurricane in 2017, which had many hurricanes. When it came from the east for five days, the experts predicted that it would go through the Caribbean islands and then it would hit the east coast of Florida and turn and go northward. In fact, there were even some beginning speculation about plans that people on the east coast should take. Uh, prepare for for their own safety. You know, possibly as far as you know, Massachusetts, New York, even. Um, there's a lot of talk about in hurricane prediction spaghetti models. In other words, they have a whole bunch of different models and they plot each one and they're kind of together at the beginning because it's very short term but after, as the days go on they start diverging from each other and you get this spaghetti going off in all these directions. I hate to state the obvious folks but what that means is that they have absolutely no idea what it's going to do. This model says it's going there, this model says it's going there, this model says it's going there. That's what spaghetti model means is that they don't know what they're doing. Um, so for five days they predicted it would go to the east coast of Florida at the bottom and turn and go up the coast. They ended up evacuating Miami, a huge major American city. Now I want you to watch this particular meteorologist as he's indicating where they think it's going to go at that time. This was a bit earlier on and he thought, or the model said that it would, might not even reach the coast at all. It might start turning and going north while it's still quite a bit offshore. Uh, just take a look at what he has to say here real quick.
what we're thinking in terms of steering. High pressure is going to steer it basically straight towards the west until it gets just on the northeastern corner of Puerto Rico here, probably uh, a couple hundred miles north of there. And then it has to make a decision. Will it continue west into the Bahamas? Some of our computer models say that's what will happen. Others say it's going to go a little bit closer to Bermuda. But if it's going to be going in this direction towards the U.S. East Coast, everyone needs to watch it closely. The real question mark is how strong will this trough of low pressure or this blocking front be? Okay, now the thing I want you to notice is where he, he said, did you notice where he anthropomorphized Hurricane Irma? Hurricane Irma is a hurricane. It's a thing. It's not a person. But at one point he said, it needs to, quote, needs to make a decision where it's going to go. That implies some kind of thought or will, free will, decision-making ability on the part of Hurricane Irma. Why would he do that? Well, notice where he did it. He's predicting all the models are together. When they start to diverge, he's distracting you from the obvious, which is that the models don't know what they're doing. They're going all over the place. He distracts you by all of a sudden, at that point, he attributes some kind of free will and thinking ability to, to Hurricane Irma. See, it's a distraction. It's his way temporarily of making you forget that he's the expert and he puts it in the hands of Hurricane Irma. It's all up to Irma. They even name it with a human name. It's Irma. It's all up to Irma. It's her decision. Okay, now when he brings it back home to stuff that's a little more short term, all of a sudden he's going to be the expert again. Irma's not going to have any say so in the matter. It's all just going to be a bunch of physical processes determining where, where it goes. And keep in mind that he's saying all of this even as he literally says that the pressure systems are steering Irma, which is exactly what is in fact going on. You see, if they don't know what, what's going on, they'll use these kind of distractions and they're off the hook. But even though they're using these distractions so you will f temporarily forget that they're the experts, they always bring it back to the fact that they are the experts. So you need to listen to them. Now, let's look at where the extremism is coming in here. In my junk science video series, again, in especially in episodes 2 and 3, where I talked about how to identify a junk scientist, one of the things I mentioned was that, well, it was several of them actually, junk scientists, unlike a legitimate scientist, a junk scientist will do everything possible to discredit anyone who has an opposing viewpoint to them, and they will take extreme, extraordinary action to try to prevent them from being allowed to participate in science. So, for example, they won't be allowed to publish. You know, the person sitting in their bedroom or their garage doing really good science. They're not allowed to publish. They can't get peer review. They can't, they, they can't go give lectures in, along with profession, professionals, experts. Um, they can't attend professional conferences. Um, and then there's a lot of name calling going on. They say you're uneducated, you don't have a PhD, you don't have our experience, you're not trained. Or they might go as far as starting going off into the, t you're a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. Now, a legitimate scientist would never, ever do that, and they would never want to, because remember, a legitimate scientist is seeking the truth. That's the only thing they care about. They want to know how the world really works. Well, if there's someone over there who has an idea, you have to go check out the idea. And you base your decision on whether to go with them on what they're producing. What are they saying? What's their science? That's a legitimate scientist. They would never go off in these directions to just discredit and shun you and keep you out of there. But the thing is, the extremism with these junk scientists as they try to take control of public policy is they are starting to try to find ways to criminalize independent scientists. So instead of just marginalizing them and shoving them out and not giving them a public forum where they can be heard, they're actually trying to put these people in prison. Now, this started after, in earnest, it, it kind of started with anti-smoking. Again, those guys, those guys are more dangerous than the Crips and the Bloods fully armed. The anti-smokers, everything they do is to try to get government to be their henchmen to put a gun to people's heads. You will pay five or six or seven or eight times the real cost of a pack of cigarettes. You will pay that much. You will stand outside in the cold and the rain. You know, so, you're, for, so everyone's healthy. You will do this. You will do that. I mean, there aren't many more violent people in America today than anti-smokers. But 
what happened with 9-11 was the Twin Towers fell down, right? They, you saw it. They fell down. It took about 10 seconds for them to go from the top, 110 stories up, to the bottom. There was a third skyscraper that fell that day most people don't know about, building number 7. A 47-story skyscraper reinforced. It had the Emergency Command Center for New York City in it. Probably the strongest building in New York City. And it also just went straight down. All edges of it just... The, the towers that fell in 10 seconds, if you apply Newton's laws of gravity, universal gravitation, if you apply those laws, you find that if you're at the top of the World Trade Center and you drop a bowling ball and it's in free fall because it's not in any way connected to the ground, nothing stands in its way except air and it just falls down, the bowling ball takes about 10 seconds to hit the ground. The buildings fell and it took them about 10 seconds to hit the ground. Now if you run a good computer model that models what they say happened, which is that the, the one floor fell and hit the other, came to a stop and accelerated the one below it, so it went up to speed and then it hit another one, and this happened 110 times, the computer models clearly show that would take about a minute and a half. You've seen the video from 9-11. Did it take 90 seconds for the towers to fall down? Did it take 90 seconds? A minute and a half? No, it took 10 seconds. It took as long as a bowling ball in free fall, plus or minus a second or two. That means it wasn't connected to the ground. You see, that's Newton's laws of universal gravitation. It's, there is no defense against that. It's natural law. So when these, when these people came out and pointed this out that, well, we have to do Newton's law to pass a class in high school. This is how simple it is. And the experts, the experts, they came out and they just brutalized these people. Oh, tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists, you, you should go to prison for even saying such a thing. You're, you're spreading these lies and all this stuff. But all they did was plug into Newton's laws and crank any, any little you know, 15 year old kid in high school can do that if they're paying attention in class. And this is where it began really as far as the criminalization. I want you to now watch a video of another Hurricane Irma meteorologist and I think what he says speaks for itself. Here you go. There's been a lot of information out there that has been quite simply bogus. Okay, and so don't go by any of that. The only reliable source would be from broadcast meteorologists and from meteorologists who are working specifically for the National Hurricane Center and for, for global meteorologists who work for other meteorological agencies. I will say this though, a lot of computer information that's been generated by the National Hurricane Center has been augmented by other people and they have posted it on their Facebook page and on their Twitter. So here's how, heads up for you folks. If you take any documentation from the National Hurricane Center and you augment it to make it look a little bit different, instead of a five-day track, you put a six, seven, eight-day track, and you literally show it transcending anywhere into the Gulf, making landfall anywhere in the East Coast. Not only are you doing a disservice to the general public by giving out false information that you think is the right thing, you're also committing a federal crime. Do not accept any information that is not from a trusted broadcast meteorologist, operational meteorologist, or from the National Hurricane Center. And above all, don't even bother trying to make any of those because it is a federal offense. Okay, now this guy claims to be an expert. In fact, he claims to be such an expert that it's a federal offense if you listen to anyone other than him, or at least if you're someone else who's competing with him. And yet... He's using airtime to threaten independent scientists, basically. Now, granted, there are some crackpots out there who come up with some crazy, wacky stuff, and it is not correct or good or right to take National Weather Service or Hurricane Forecast Center data and to modify it so it looks like it came from the government. That's, that's wrong. That's obviously wrong. But listen to what he said you should only the only reliable information you will get is from us and he's even including journalists in there <laughs> the fake news 
he devoted airtime to that. He could have been warning people to try to save lives, but instead he's using airtime to literally threaten his competition with felony prosecution. Folks, and they're doing this with coronavirus as well. If you look at the news reports, there's all kinds of people calling for anyone who speaks up against what the experts are saying. They should be criminalized. They should be arrested, thrown in jail. In fact, it should be very serious, a federal offense. They should be in jail for 10 years. That's lunacy. No legitimate scientist would ever endorse something like that. It's the opposite of what legitimate science is, which is a marketplace of ideas that stand on their own merit, not on what the consensus of this cult is. All right? And by the way, before I finish up with Irma, I should tell you what happened in the end. Irma, after they evacuated Miami, and these guys spent five days trying to figure out, well, is it going to land over in Miami, or is the eye going to go over Hollywood or Fort Lauderdale? We can't quite tell. While they're sitting there debating that all this time, when, when it came time, Irma just kind of ignored Miami altogether, went south of it, kind of waved at Miami, said, hey, how's it going? Went around to the west side of Florida, and turned and went up, and it smacked into Naples, in Tampa. The people who live there got about 24 hours notice to board up their homes, secure their places, and evacuate. Meanwhile, all the people who had five days to do all that stuff on the other side, they did it for nothing. And you literally show it transcending anywhere into the Gulf, making landfall anywhere in the East Coast. Not only are you doing a disservice to the general public by giving out false information that you think is the right thing, you're also committing a federal crime. And you literally show it transcending anywhere into the Gulf. That's your predictive model for you, folks. If you wonder what the reality of this coronavirus, all these models would be, if we didn't have a stay-at-home order, we would know because we wouldn't be interfering with it. And in the end, we would be able to see how wrong these models really are. And with that in mind, let's now take a look at the specifics of how computer models work in terms of the computer programming. Okay, so now that we've looked at uh, Hurricane Irma and how those models are not exactly as reliable as we might want to believe they are, even though they have a whole bunch of things that are very well known, these low and high pressure systems, let's look at the computer programming itself for a model. Now, I'm not going to show you actual computer code. I, I don't have access to it. There's no point. What I did was I created the skeleton of simple computer programs more or less in English rather than computer ease. But it's going to show you what we do when we program a computer. Let's create a computer model, shall we? A predictive model. What we want to do is create a model that will predict whether or not um, this is for people who build chairs, and it's going to predict whether or not the user of that chair, if the chair will support their weight. So let's look at the first one here. Now I, I put the uh, inputs in, and the outputs in gold, I put the processing in white, and then the human resources that are needed in blue here. What are the inputs for this program? You need to know how many legs does the chair have. And in the computer program I'm going to call it numb legs you need to know the weight capacity for each leg. How much weight can one leg support? I call that weight capacity. And then I have how much does the user weigh? And I call that user weight. Now in terms of processing this program you basically do this. You do a mathematical calculation where I create a new um, I create a new variable, it's called weight supported, so it is the amount of weight that the chair will support, and that is equal to the number of legs times the weight capacity of each leg. Okay, so if it has four legs and they can each hold 50 pounds, then in theory the whole chair can hold 200 pounds. Then there's a logical operation, not a mathematical, but a logical. In other words, the answer isn't a number, the answer is either true or false. And it says, if the weight supported by the chair is greater than or equal to the weight of the user, then print out the statement, the chair will support this person's weight. Else, which means otherwise, print, the chair will not support this person's weight. 
that's essentially the entire computer program. This is a predictive model. This model will predict whether the chair, based on the information given to it, will support the user's weight. Notice the human resources needed for this. A computer programmer. That's it. The output is a written statement of whether or not the chair will support the user's weight, and it's going to be that way through all of this. So, look at how simple that was, but keep in mind that this can, as simple as this is, this can be inaccurate. What if somebody puts in the wrong number of legs? What if they miscalculated or misread the amount of weight that each leg can support? It can support 40 pounds, but you thought it could do 50, so you put that in there. That's a 10 pound difference and there's four legs. That's a 40 pound difference in what it can hold. You see garbage in, garbage out. So the data going into this computer program has to be right. And when you actually write out the computer code to produce this, this model, if you make any errors in the code, then even if you put in correct data, you could get out an incorrect answer. All right, very simple. Let's move along to the next one. What I'm gonna do here what I did here was I made this model of the chair more complicated. Let's say we want this to be much more precise. It's very important that nobody sits on that chair and it just collapses beneath them. So what I did was I increased the number of inputs and of course that's going to increase the amount of processing we do. In other words, the amount of analysis we do on this chair. In this instance, we're going to do two things we did not do before. One we're going to consider how the chair is built. In other words, the construction materials and the way that it is manufactured in terms of its strength. And two, we're going to consider a little more specifics about the weight of the person who is going to use the chair, the user. So in this instance, look at what we have. Now the inputs, you're going to ask questions like, again, how many legs? But we're also going to ask what type of wood is used. Is it oak? Is it maple? Is it balsa? What type of wood? They have different amounts of strength, right? We're going to ask what's the type of lumber cut used on it. Now, I'm not a chair expert. I'm going back to the way guitars are manufactured, but you know, you can have quarter sawn and all these different types of cuts against the grain or along with the grain, and that affects the strength of the wood for its intended purpose if you're going to be putting compression on it, a lot of weight on it. Okay, the next thing we're going to ask for is some kind of measure of the glue strength for the glue that's used to put the legs into the chair. Then we're going to ask about the user, we're going to ask what is their weight distribution? What that means is what if you're very tall and skinny and muscular? You could weigh 300 pounds and still look like a stick figure from a distance. Well, if you sit on that chair, your center of gravity, the, the weight is distributed not very far from your center of gravity. What if you're a, sorry folks, but what if you're a typical Walmart shopper and you sit and most of you hangs off all four edges of the chair? Well, you could also weigh 300 pounds. The thing is, you're only about 4 foot 11 tall, right? Your weight is being distributed very differently. Now there's other factors we're going to look at in a moment, but so I changed the program to get all this information instead of the minimal information we had before. Now the processing here is very, very different than before. It's way different, much, much, much more complicated. Now I had to introduce subroutines. So instead of doing straight up mathematical equations, I have to create, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bunch of other mini computer programs that we call subroutines that will do certain functions to give me information I need to do the next part of this computer program. All right. Now look at the processing section. Weight capacity, again, the weight capacity would be the what the chair can handle ultimately. Now I say instead of having a mathematical equation, I call a subroutine. That's what this calculate leg weight capacity is. It's a subroutine. Notice that it has parentheses after it and it has those inputs, some of the inputs in there. Numb legs, wood type, lumber cut, glue strength. What that means is that weight capacity is equal to the results of another computer program which is called calculate leg weight capacity and that subroutine is going to use those four inputs. Number of legs, wood type, etc. So that's how I'm going to get what the weight capacity is. Now, there could be 
there could be anywhere from a dozen to maybe a couple hundred lines of code, maybe even more. In theory, you could, you know, who knows? I don't know. Again, I didn't write the program itself. But in that subroutine could be a hundred lines of code. That's a whole lot more than the basically one line of code that was in the previous model. Let's look at the next line in the processing. Max user force. Notice the word force there. You see, what I'm doing is instead of thinking just in terms of weight, how much does this person weigh, I'm thinking in terms of how much force, like in the physics sense, how much force are they going to exert on this chair. And that involves a lot of things. Because what I want to do is take into account that what if, if the person weighs 150 pounds, there's a difference between if they just walk back up to the seat and they just sit down nice and neat, or if they kind of run over there and they hop and they more or less jump and land their butt on the seat because if you're if you're just sitting down comfortably fine it's about 150 pounds but if you come over and you land on the seat the force you're putting on there is the equivalent or similar to much more weight maybe 200 pounds okay just like if I if I hit you like this it doesn't really hurt but if I hit you hard I can break your jaw same thing with the chair. So I'm looking at the force. Now to do that, I need to call up some pretty heavy hitters in the physics world. There's this particular subroutine, which I call calculate user weight force, which only uses two inputs. It uses the weight of the user, and it also uses their weight distribution. Some kind of measure of are they skinny, are they, are they, are they skinny or are they fat is what it boils down to. <laughs> Um, but I'm also going to take a couple things into consideration. I'm going to take into consideration what is the worst case scenario of them backing onto the chair and pff, landing on it hard. I'm also going to take uh, the worst case scenario of a person who might constantly adjust themselves in the chair because that's going to put these kind of, you know, shearing loads onto the chair. You know, like wind shear and puts on an airplane, that's one of the leading causes of air crashes is wind shear. The plane's flying along and something comes along in a direction you don't expect and it cuts, it, it, it changes the aerodynamic properties very quickly. Well, if you're sitting on a chair but you're constantly doing these adjustments and things like I have to do in this chair because of the metal bar that's sticking into my side all the time, well, that changes the the glue strength becomes a big issue because after a while that chair might collapse even if it took your weight from the beginning. So there's a whole nother computer program and this one's probably going to have a whole lot more code in it. Then I finally have the final code, the, the master code for this program. If chair supports user and that's another subroutine I wrote. That one uses these two things that I calculated in the program already. Weight capacity and max user force. And I call it if I call it chair supports user so that when you read it you know what it's what it means. If chair supports the user, then print the chair will support this person's weight. Else print the chair will not support this person's weight. Okay, but here's the real key. Here's where you really start to see the complexity of this. Look under the human resources needed for a computer program to write this program properly. They need the computer programmer, of course, and they better know what they're doing. You could also need the expertise of a carpenter, someone who builds chairs and understands how these legs are glued in there, how they're assembled, what kind of forces they are subject to. You need the assistance of a lumber expert because they're the ones who are going to tell you accurately how strong is this type of wood. Um, what's the strength of this type of wood cut? you're gonna need the assistance of a physicist there's a lot of physics involved in here now you're dealing with forces not just weight but all kinds of forces you're gonna need a glue expert or perhaps a chemist who has that ability but somebody who's gonna be able to tell you how strong is this glue gonna be um, under these different loads and shifting loads and shearing totally different than the previous program you're probably also gonna to wanna to speak to a human anatomist to get an idea of what is the maximum that people can sit on that, say, without breaking their tailbone. I mean, in theory, someone could jump off of a six-foot wall and land on the chair, but in practice, they're not going to do that because they'll break their butt, right? So 
look at this. Look at, can you see the complexity of this? You're going to have to talk to all of these experts. You're going to have to interview them and interview them properly. If this were a crucial program, you would need to interview several carpenters, several lumber experts, several physicists, etc., to make sure that they're all telling you the same thing because it's possible that an expert doesn't know what they're doing or they might just make a mistake. The lines of code in here, now in the master program you only see three lines of code but they're calling up subroutines, all three of them. There could be dozens or even hundreds of lines of code in this computer program when you write out those subroutines. That translates to hundreds or thousands of instructions that the computer has to f follow. If there's an error anywhere in there, garbage in, garbage out. If there's an error in anything these experts tell you and you program based on what they told you but they were wrong, garbage in, garbage out. Do you see the tremendous complexity of this program versus the previous one? And all I did was add a couple of questions, simple questions. What kind of wood is used? What's the lumber cut? What's the strength of the glue? What's the user's weight distribution? That's basically four questions I didn't ask before. And this program has exploded into this ridiculously complex... Now the thing is, if everything is done right and the data input is correct, this thing is much more accurate than the previous one. Much more accurate. Now I think you can see where I'm going with this, so you can take that to the next level. I'm not going to do it here. Um, I have a problem with the camera overheating and shutting off repeatedly, so I'm going to try to move along here. Let's go to a... Um, in fact, I'm going to let the camera cool off, and then I'll be back with the next part of this. Okay, so let's look at another very simple computer model. This one is going to model um, whether or not a particular individual is a threat. Alright, so let's take a look at this. The input just asks one simple question. Is the person homeless? Yes or no? And I store that true statement, yes or no, under the variable called homeless. As far as processing goes, very simple. It just says, if homeless, in other words, if homeless is true, then print, this person is a threat. Else, print, this person is not a threat. Now, the human resources needed for a computer program like this is just a computer programmer, somebody to type this code in and uh, compile it. And, of course, the outputs, again, is just a written statement. I hope you understand from this that this is a very, very accurate computer model of osteotophobia, where people no longer think, and instead they replace critical thinking with these rules of thumb, these heuristics. If you're homeless, then you're a threat. This is a perfectly accurate model of that, because that is how simple-minded osteotophobia osteotophobia is. Now look here, um, I just changed the word homeless to the word black. Now you have an accurate model of racism. I'll change that word now to Jewish. Now you have an accurate model of anti-Semitism. If you're Jewish, then you're a threat. And you can carry that where you want to go. I won't associate with you or I will commit genocide against your entire race. It's up to you what you want to do with it. But I hope you see there's no thinking going on, certainly not in the computer program, and definitely not in the human being. One more example. Let's change that to a transplant to Minnesota. I've gone over in my videos on the Homeless Consultant channel how Minnesota functions as a cult. Minnesota nice is a myth. It's the opposite of nice. They're the most vicious people I've ever seen in my life. They're deadly. Look at the situation I'm in. I'm recording this literally 300 feet away from my office right now during my working hours. If it weren't for the stay-at-home order, I would be in that empty office working and earning money. And instead, I can't work for a living. My 99 empl fellow co-workers are all working from home as if nothing happened. They haven't lost a paycheck yet. I'm losing everything, and I'm homeless. These people are absolutely vicious. 
and anyone who's been a transplant to Minnesota, uh, the vast majority of them, again, I've gone over this before, but they do not like outsiders because cults do not like outsiders. So you can put in here, this is a perfectly accurate model as well. Maybe not quite as much because there are some transplants who get along, but it's usually the transplants who behave the same way. They're vicious, they're self-interested, they're, they're, they lie, they don't have a, a lot of morality going on. So, I mean, this is a very simple computer program, but it's incredibly accurate. But let's say, um, now, for example, in the if-then statement, what if you put in there, um, if the person is a thinker, if the person is a critical thinker, then make a rational, well-informed argument. Else, call the other person names and accuse them of putting everyone else at risk and killing them with no supporting evidence. That's an accurate model of whether somebody is a critical thinker or not. It's not a real detailed model, but if you have a critical thinker, they will make a rational, well-informed argument. What do you think I'm doing with all these videos? Why do you think these videos are so long? It's a rational, well-informed argument that I'm presenting to you. Or you can just have these Minnesotans, nice Minnesotans on Twitter, who call the other person names and accuse them of putting everyone else at risk or killing them with no supporting evidence. Plato's Allegory of the Cave. These people are oblivious to the universe that goes on around them. Alright, so let me, uh, let's try to tweak this threat model though. Let's try to make this a little more accurate than just mindless osteotophobia. What I did here was I added just one more factor, one more variable. In the inputs, it's going to ask, is the person homeless? Yes or no. But it also asks one other question. Is the person violent? Yes or no. Now, in the processing, it, uh, it says, if homeless and violent. Now, that means the condition where both are true. The person is homeless and the person is violent. In that case, print, this person is a threat. Otherwise, print, this person is not a threat. Again, you only need the computer programmer for this. With all their biases and prejudices and flaws, you just need a computer programmer. Now, I hope you can see you've got a bit of a problem here. This computer program is not going to tell you that a violent housed person is a threat, is it? Because you have to be homeless and violent for this to trigger a threat. But if you're housed and you're violent, this program will not identify you as a threat. Also, who's making the judgment as to whether this person is violent? Is it some social service worker? Is it a parole officer? Who's making that judgment? Is it based on their previous action? They have demonstrated, proven violent behavior in the past? Where's that coming from? You can see where all this bias and interpretation, uncertainty, even comes into a, a model that's this simple. Okay, this model is making an assumption based on osteotophobia. It's making an assumption that homeless people are a threat, that they're bad, just because they don't have a home. No other reason. Take somebody who's in a home, a lot of people are going to lose their homes because of the stay-at-home order. A lot of people. Right now, while they're in their homes, they're considered by ordinary people, they're considered just normal, ordinary members of society. I'm telling you from, from experience, one minute after they become homeless and they suddenly walk out there and they start telling people, I don't have a place to live, please help me, they will be instantly regarded as a threat by people who exhibit osteotophobia. Nothing in the person has changed whatsoever except that they lost their home. I know from experience. Let's change just one thing in this model. I'm Just one simple thing. This time I'm going to change it in the processing section. I change the word and to the word or. See, these are called logical operators. In mathematics you have plus and divide, multiply, you know, times. That's mathematics. In logical you have things like and, or, if, you know, XOR. You have all these different logical functions and the answer isn't a number, it's a truth statement. True or false. If we change it to or, what do we get? Nothing else has changed in the program. If homeless or violent, then print this person is a threat. Otherwise, print this person is not a threat. So now, 
it's going to print out that you're a threat if you're homeless, even if you're not violent, because it says homeless or violent. So if you're just homeless but nonviolent, it's going to print out that you're a threat. But also, if you're violent, it's going to print out that you're a threat whether you're homeless or not. So it does cover the house people who are violent. But it still makes no sense at all because it's still founded on osteotheophobia. You see, the bias of the programmer is built into the way the computer program works. It's built in. And this is, this is a one-line computer program, folks. One line. I write it out, you know, stacked like this, but it's one line of computer code. So I hope you can understand that this is a rotten computer program. This thing isn't useful at all. Now, there is one way to make it more useful. Let's go one step further. Look at that. This time I actually took something away. I made it simpler and it becomes more accurate. Now it just asks the question, is the person violent? And the coding, the instructions in the computer says, if violent, then print this person is a threat. Otherwise, print this person is not a threat. What did I do different here? Why is this so accurate? Whereas the previous one that had more conditions, it should, it's more complex, right? So therefore, you know, like big experts, they have all this complexity and they write big, long journal articles, peer reviewed. You know, how could they go through all that effort and not have it be better than someone who's sitting in their basement with a nice simple model? Because I removed the bias. I took the osteotheophobia out of here. The reference to homeless is gone. So if the person is violent, then it tells you the person is a threat. And that's a pretty accurate model. It's not perfect because there are a lot of people out there who are a threat, but they're not violent. Look at the Minnesota authorities. This is now the third, the third round of where these Minnesota has come out of the clear blue sky and destroyed my life. When I'm just sitting here minding my own business. They haven't been violent toward me, but they're destroying my entire life. They are a threat. They are a mortal threat to me. So the model, even this program doesn't tell you absolutely everything. All right. So I just wanted to show you how computer programs work in the simplest way I could think of. And I hope that does help you understand. I didn't have to go through and show you all the instructions and things like that. But what you need to understand is that when you get into things like predictive disease and contagious disease modeling you have a program along these lines except it may have hundreds or thousands of lines of code in it which translates to maybe hundreds thousands or tens of thousands of specific instructions that the computer follows and if there's an error anywhere in the coding garbage in garbage out even if the data submitted is accurate it can still produce bad results but also, what about the data itself? The data is so subject to the bias of the programmers. And are, are the people at the CDC, are the people at Imperial College, are the people who are creating these models, are, what is their bias and their prejudice? I mean, for one thing, they have a self-interest built right into it. They are epidemiologists. They are looking out after their own industry, their own career field, their own job, their own self-interest. It helps them if the model seems to produce something that says the sky's falling, the world's going to end. Because that makes this person more important than they were before. That is job security, that is prestige, that is respect. And whether they're programming that in deliberately doesn't matter. It's in their minds. It's the same as the person who slips the word homeless into this threat model. They just slip it in without thinking because they just, they're so disgusted by homeless people that it's perfectly natural. They didn't even think about what it did to the program. They didn't even think about it. But here you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of lines of code, thousands of instructions, and the mathematical equations are not things like this x plus y equals z. You're dealing with calculus with these computer models for contagious disease. You're dealing with differential equations, partial differential equations. Now, the mathematics is beautiful. It's really interesting and fascinating, no doubt. But once you start programming that into a computer and you start doing it in the sheer numbers that has to be done for these computer models, again, if there's an error anywhere, not just if there's an error, let's say this is the equation, but you accidentally put in a T instead of an S, that's an error. 
But what if the equation itself is wrong? The equation itself really doesn't properly represent reality. You could type it incorrectly, but the equation doesn't belong there in the first place. You see, these things are just wrought with errors all over the place because nothing is certain when it comes to contagious disease. So you are literally dealing with an exponential rise in the, in the um, number of things that could cause this computer model to fail the more complex it gets. And a computer model for contagious disease is mind-bogglingly more complicated than the stuff I just showed you. So, unless they're dealing with absolute certainties, look at what they're dealing with that is uncertain. They don't seem to have the foggiest idea how contagious the disease really is. They don't seem to have the foggiest idea whether people are dying from the disease or if they're just dying because they had the disease, but they died of something else. They had AIDS. They died of AIDS, but they had coronavirus. And they keep getting logged down as if they died of coronavirus. The, these people have said all along, we don't know. We need more data. We need more time. They say, I don't know, all the time. The last video I did called The Experts Warn, I put that there for a reason. It was to get you prepared for this. If you haven't watched that, watch it. It's, pretty, it's about 20 minutes long. Very important stuff in there. Notice how these experts, whenever they talk about things, they use vague terminology all the time. That is a red flag planted in the soil that says, we don't know what we're talking about. If they say, this could cause cancer, well, that doesn't mean anything. Because if it doesn't cause cancer, that statement is still correct. All they said was, it could cause cancer. It might not, but it could cause cancer. But the expert is trying to scare you emotionally by saying, this could cause cancer. Even though their statement literally, linguistically means, it might not cause cancer. So what are you afraid of? This is the problem with computer models, folks. This is not modeling a guitar amplifier where everything is known. It follows laws of nature, laws of electronics. It follows natural laws that you can model specifically. And as long as you don't have a coding error in there, it will sound just like a real guitar. This is fundamentally different than a flight simulator. Fundamentally different. That's the problem with predictions. Now you can do predictive programming like I did with the chair and it can be extremely accurate. But guess what? Everything in there was known. It followed natural laws. You knew from experience and from testing how the glue functioned. What made the glue break down. You knew all these things. With contagious disease, they don't know any of this stuff. They're winging it. They don't have a good background of, of information of other pandemics to draw upon. And I'm going to talk about that pretty soon. And you're going to see why that's so serious. You're going to find out. Well, I'm just going to tell you right now, actually. I'm going to tell you right now. Remember the, what I told you about with the space shuttle uh, Columbia? When it crashed, they, they mapped out on a map where the items fell from the shuttle on the ground, from California all the way to Texas and even into Louisiana. They mapped it out. Then from that, they could reverse do a reverse model as if it were going back up and recompiling itself in the air, and they could see how the thing fell apart, and that gave them information that helped them with their investigation. It did not give them the answer. No computer could tell them that the real cause of this was something that had happened seven days earlier at launch over in Florida. There was no computer that could tell you that just from where stuff fell in Texas. It requires thinking to do that. But that, when that stuff fell, it was a crime if you moved any of that if you found debris from the shuttle on the ground, it was a crime if you moved it because you're tampering with evidence. But guess what, folks? What epidemiologists could do well if they had any interest in doing it, but that requires letting their self-interest, their selfish agenda go and actually worrying about people. If they did that, what they would do is they would let these pandemics play out and do the best they can with reasonable measures informing people wash your hands things like that try to keep your distance you know be aware of this like they are in South Dakota God bless the governor of South Dakota who has come right out and said people are responsible for their own safety and their own health 
The government cannot treat them like little children. Now, if you do that, like they're doing in South Dakota, guess what? After the pandemic's over, then the, you can gather data of what actually happened. What did the disease really, truly do? Not we think it's going to do this, or we it could do this, it might do that. What did it do? And you can only tell after the fact. Just like the space shuttle, you could only check that debris field after it disintegrated. But by doing that, you gather information that you need to prevent another shuttle from falling apart like that. Same thing here. If these epidemiologists would quit recommending that we change the natural order of things and that we shut down a society, which is not the way people work, it isn't the way society functions in a social species. If you don't do that and you let the pandemic play out, yes, people will die. I'm sorry, folks. That is life. If you can't accept that much, you're going to have a long, long life of misery and fear. Biting your nails down to the bone. People die. You will die. I will die. It's life. You can take reasonable precautions against a disease. What we can't do, though, with the stay-at-home order in Minnesota, there's no way to do a post-mortem on it because we have no data after it's all over to know what would have happened if we had left things alone. So what happened? Was it because of the stay-at-home order that only, you know, uh, 194 people died? And it would have been 205 people if we didn't have a stay-at-home order. If all these people didn't have their lives destroyed, there might have been 10 other people who died. Or there might have been 10,000 people who died. We don't know. So if we don't know because they tamper, basically they're tampering with the evidence. By, by saying that these computer models know more than they do and calling for stay-at-home orders, we're changing the way that we function in society so when it's all over and the smoke clears from this pandemic, we can't analyze what the disease itself actually did. Because we kept throwing a monkey wrench and everything. We stayed inside. We wore masks. We, we hid and ran and, and uh, cowered in fear. And that's not the way people normally work. So we don't know what the disease itself would have done. And that means we have precisely zero information to use going forward to help future generations so that they don't suffer from that kind of thing. You see, part of being a scientist is that you have to let yourself go. You may not come up with a cure for cancer, but you might be able to make the contribution that makes it possible for someone in the next generation to do it. You have to let your ego go and focus on the task at hand. That's what these people won't do. Governor Waltz is literally tampering with the evidence. It's as if he went down to Texas after Columbia fell to the ground, and he went out at night, and he found all these parts of the shuttle, and he moved them to a different county. And he moved this one, he threw it in a lake. And he took this one, he put it in his pocket, and he drove back to Minnesota with it. That's a felony, tampering with evidence like that. Then, when the experts, the, the investigators come out, and they map where all these parts are, they're all in a different place because somebody tampered with it. Now when they do their model, it's going to give you bogus information about how the shuttle fell apart, and they can no longer investigate what happened. That's what Tim Waltz is doing. We will have nothing, zero, valid information to work with to help us understand what this pandemic did so that we can take better action the next time it happens. This guy is more of a threat than the virus is. And it's not just him, all the governors who are falling for this scam. Because they have stars in their eyes, they're blinded with science, and they're believing the experts when they were elected to be the leader. They were not elected to just sit there and blindly follow these people who call themselves scientists. These junk scientists. Alright, so I have made that point clear. Uh, I'm going to let the camera cool off here, and I will be back with the... Uh, the uh, remainder of this episode. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to finally tie all of this up in a nice bow by going back to where I started in the first place. And um, before I do that, I just want to mention one quick thing. 
as an intellectually curious person who wants to be a legitimate scientist, in other words, I want to understand the truth, I want to make one thing clear. The mathematics and the study behind all of this for the people who are really trying to understand contagious disease, it's very impressive. It is amazing. I have a lot of respect for people, even in epidemiology, who really want to understand the truth and pull their ego and their self-interest out of it at the detriment of everyone else. The mathematics is beautiful. It is fascinating. And if I were to live several lives, I would probably devote one of those lives to creating my own computer models for the spread of contagious disease. And that's the truth. But I would never, ever, ever take my model to a government official and ask them and certainly would not pressure them to use that for public policy because I know the limits of the model. The, when you're studying something like this, you get the best results by studying what happened after it's over. But trying to predict things, you're just interfering, you're just tampering with the evidence. You're, you're losing all of the data that you need to truly understand what does happen because it's not happening anymore. Now we've got a stay-at-home order happening instead. But I want to make it clear, I'm not, I'm not just lashing out at anyone who does math or science. There's so much beautiful stuff there. And again, the microbiologists and the people who deal with the actual viruses, the ones who learn you know, which, uh, you know, which part of the virus attaches to the human cells and causes these problems, the, the people with the microscopes and everything, my goodness, my, my hat off to you. It's, it's amazing what you do. All right. But like I said, let's end this up by going back to where I started at the very beginning, my first video about coronavirus at all, where I started talking about how this stay-at-home order was going to destroy me, if not countless other people in Minnesota. I was at work. And I got an email that said, Governor has announced a stay-at-home order. They changed my schedule for the next day, which was the last day you could work, so that instead of working at night like I usually do, I was working in the morning. And then <clears throat> you can't work anymore. And I was just in shock. I, I was like, this isn't possible. This is the United States of America. We have a constitution. You can't do that. That's not possible. So within two hours, whenever my next break was, I immediately went outside, got on the phone, called the governor's office. First thing I did. The first thing out of my mouth when I talked to that aide was the only thing and the most important thing I had to say. I said, the governor needs to understand that not everybody lives the same way that he does. That's exactly what I said to this woman. And she completely misunderstood because she also doesn't understand that other people do not live the same way that she does. You know what she said instead? She responded by saying, Governor Waltz is the most empathetic man I've ever met. He didn't always live in a mansion. Well, folks, I wasn't talking about living in a mansion. I wasn't talking about him living in a mansion and me living in a two-bedroom suburban home or an apartment or a trailer. I was talking about I fundamentally live in a different way than housed people do. Me and the other 19,601 or more homeless Minnesotans, that is. All right. To show you what I mean, which is something that she didn't bother to investigate, she just gave me that bogus phone number and said to give me a call if you need anything. Here's my cell number, and it was a non-working number. Here's what I was talking about. For all these people who are sitting at home, if they feel oppressed because they're stuck at home, look at what they get to benefit from. They have familiar surroundings. They have safety. They have security. They have privacy. They have no harassment from others in theory. Of course, where I live, the reason I'm living in the car is because I had nothing but harassment from my neighbors. But if they actually enforce the law, which they tend to do for other people, not for transplants, then no harassment from others. They have control over their environment. They can set the temperature, the humidity. They have control over their physical stuff. They have a comfortable bed. They have a toilet. They have a bath or a shower or both. They have a kitchen where they can prepare nutritious meals, hot meals. They have storage space. They have electricity. They have waste disposal. They have running water. They have full and immediate access to all their possessions. They have mobility in the sense that they can at least move their body. They can make their body move within the confines of their home. 
they have a place to exercise for the same reason. If it's only jumping jacks and push-ups, they can do something to get their heart going. They have the ability to earn an income. Many of them can work from home like every single one of my coworkers. I'm the only one who's not allowed to work because I'm homeless, which is discrimination, of course. Or you could engage in internet commerce and at least maybe get a little extra income. And lastly, they have an address so that they can receive things like stimulus checks, for example, unemployment. Now let's look at what I have living in this car as a homeless person in the state of Minnesota, which is a hotbed for osteotophobia. They don't care if the homeless live or die. They put a homeless person on the news every two or three months to try to give everyone the impression we're taking care of the homeless, and they leave us out here to suffer and die off camera. Let's see what my life is like. Do I have familiar surroundings? Only to the extent that I move this car from one place to another and I end up repeating myself in many cases. But I have to keep moving all the time. I have to dodge the police, I have to dodge the housed people who are such a threat to me. There's nothing familiar, I'm not going to the same place. Well, like I said, when I wake up, the first thing I do is look in both directions to figure out where I am today. There's nothing familiar about it. Am I safe? Do I have safety? I'm inside a vehicle. Vehicles are one of the leading causes of death. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week since the stay-at-home order, I am in this car, except when I step out to use the bathroom, get gas, get food. Um, every time I start up the car and move along, I could get in a car crash. I could either lose everything, or I could be killed, or severely injured. This thing has got electrical problems out the wazoo. It could catch fire at any time. And I'm breathing those fumes, the carbon monoxide, all the time. That's why my singing voice is completely gone now. Do I have security? <laughs> I'm in a car that is, I'm literally sitting inside a cage that has glass at 360 degrees around me, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't have anything that resembles security, friends. People can see me from a long ways away. They can watch me. They can have binoculars. They can spy on me all they want. And I've just got this open who knows what's out there is all I can see. How about privacy? For the same reason, no. Anybody can look in this car and see me right now. I don't have anything that resembles privacy, and I haven't had anything in three weeks that resembles privacy. When's the last time you had that? That's what a prisoner experiences. These people in their homes, they're not prisoners, friends. They are not prisoners. They're bad citizens for not standing up, but they're not prisoners. No harassment from others. Uh, I put many videos up about how I'm stalked by these housed people all the time. No. Control over my environment. First of all, I'm not in my environment. I am, by definition, I'm homeless. I'm always on someone else's property or I'm on public property. I'm not on my property. I have no environment. Fundamentally different way to live. I am in someone else's environment all day, every day. I cannot control who or what is near me. If I don't want a scary looking free candy van sitting right next to my car, I can't do a lot about it because they can just pull up right next to me at any moment. All I can do is leave. I cannot control the temperature in this car. The heater doesn't work. The air conditioner doesn't work. This window doesn't roll up or down. I can't get airflow. I can't do anything. Right now, it's more than 80 degrees in this car. And it's going to get hotter today. I can't control whether it's dark or light. I have to go with the flow. I can't... I mean, I, I, you could put blankets up in the window and everything, but then you introduce other perils because now I can't see my environment to maintain my security. But I can't go in and just turn the dimmer switch down. I'm at the mercy of the sun, whether it's overcast or bright. I cannot control, again, the, the lighting. Is it overcast? or If it's overcast, I can actually see this computer and get some work done. If it's super bright, I can't see anything on the screen and I can't get anything done. I can just sit in the seat and vegetate. That's all I do. I can't control the humidity, because my humidity is whatever it is outside. That's it. I, I have no climate control in the car. I can't control whether my environment is wet or dry. If it starts raining, I have to step out of here to get gas, food, and the bathroom. And I'm going to get wet, and I'm going to sit back in this car wet. I don't have control over that. I have little protection from the rain for that reason. I have no protection from hail or lightning as the storms begin. Do I have a comfortable bed? No. I sit in this seat for the last three weeks, 24 hours a day, except when I go to the bathroom or food or gas. I have sat in this seat for three weeks. No blood flow, no exercise, nothing. I've got this metal bar jamming into my side 
the whole time. No. Comfortable bed. Do I have a toilet? No. I must go to a public toilet, which with the stay-at-home order pretty much limits me only to gas stations where wonderful, nice, housed Minnesotans urinate all over the seat, sometimes defecate on the seat, sometimes vomit on the seat, and the homeless guy has to clean all that up before he uses it. Do I have a bath or a shower? No. It is day, what, 24 I think now? without a shower or a shave. I want this hair gone so badly. Do I have a kitchen where I can prepare nutritious meals and hot meals? No. The only thing I've eaten is potato chips and Cheez-Its with two exceptions. On two occasions I bought a pizza, but I don't have enough money to do that often. Otherwise, for three weeks I have eaten potato chips and Cheez-Its. Do you understand? I live fundamentally different than Governor Waltz. Storage space. I have no storage space. You see all the junk in this car? It bounces around. It gets lost. It gets broken. I'm spilling drinks every single day. I spilled it this morning and it's, it went all over all my electronics. I had to spend a long time drying that out. Electricity. The only electricity I have, I have this power inverter with one outlet and a couple USBs, but only one outlet I can use at a time. I can use this camera or I can use the computer. If the computer has battery, I can use both. Waste disposal. No, I must travel to someone else's trash can. And since the only places I can really go, again, are these gas stations, how do you think it feels when I go in, I'm carrying these bags of junk, I get out of the car and I have to go to the same gas stations all the time because I, I, I am a limited in mobility, and these people inside watch me come out and bring a bunch of bags and put it in the trash can that they are going to have to empty later. How do you think they look at me? Do you think they look at me as a real winner? someone who they appreciate. I don't want to do that to them. They don't even know I'm in there cleaning their toilet for them. <sighs> running water. No, the only running water I have, again, is when I go into a public bathroom and quite often that water is rank and putrid. Sometimes it just smells like sulfur and it makes me just start gagging, especially if I ever try to brush my teeth and that stuff. Full and immediate access to all my possessions? No, I have to go to storage when they're open. They're only open during the daytime if I want access to my own possessions. Mobility? No, I'm stuck in the seat. If I leave this car, I leave everything I own and my home at risk of these housed people. Not homeless people. The housed people are the ones who will steal or destroy this car. I can't leave the seat. I have no blood flow, no circulation, nothing that resembles a healthy way to live. A place to exercise? Same thing. Absolutely not. The ability to earn an income? No, I told you. I'm the only person who is not allowed to work. Total discrimination against the homeless. Do I have an address for receiving stimulus checks? No, I live in a car. The stimulus checks, they might go in direct deposit, but the thing is, they're based on your previous tax filings. I can't file my taxes. It's a felony because I have to put in a resident address and I don't have one. I have contacted the... IRS repeatedly for help with this, they refuse to even discuss it with me until I provide them with a resident address. So I'm paying my taxes, in fact I'm paying more than I'm supposed to be. I'll never get it back. So I pay my taxes, but I can't file my taxes and you had to file your taxes to get a stimulus check. So I don't get one. And Traditionally it's been the same thing with unemployment. I've heard there's some changes there, but I don't know the details on that yet. I don't want unemployment. I want to work for a living and I don't understand why the homeless person is the only one in the state of Minnesota who wants to work for a living while they're calling me a lazy bum because I live in a car. This is lunacy people. <clears throat> you see the response that Governor Waltz didn't always live in a mansion is not relevant. This aide did not understand what I was talking about. They literally cannot comprehend the idea that other people, people who are not them, you know, empathy, real empathy, not what she called empathy, but the real thing. We live in a fundamentally different way. And those people living out in ditches on the street in a tent, they live fundamentally different than I do. Now let me ask you this question. Again, there's 19,601 or more of people just in the homeless in Minnesota. There's people who have all kinds of life situations, even in homes. 
they live fundamentally different than Waltz does. They live fundamentally different than I do. Fundamentally different than their neighbor does. Everyone has their own unique set of circumstances and life stories. Only a communist nation that dehumanizes people down to just the level of animal, just a pawn, only they are going to treat it as if everyone's exactly the same and everyone's going through the same thing in life. That is not the case. Now, let me ask you this. Which of these computer models that model contagious disease takes that into consideration? I'll answer it for you. None. They don't. They don't, they don't even attempt to. They treat everybody as exactly the same. At best, and I haven't found a model yet that does this, but if it ever did, at best, it would take people who are housed and call them X, and it would take people who are homeless and it would call them Y. And it would attribute some mathematical constant that's a bit different for one than the other, and that's it. But all the stuff I just listed out, which I didn't even mention everything, did I? I didn't mention the daily diarrhea, the daily bleeding. I didn't mention any of that stuff yet either. Those computer models do not take any of that into consideration. They don't take into consideration the fact that when I get, when I keep having to go into these gas stations all the time, I tr naturally try to stay away from the employees just because I'm so humiliated. Nothing to do with disease. They treat me like any other person who will just go right up in their face. The models don't understand the way that different people are different people. The entire model only exists of very complicated mathematical equations. Calculus, you know, if you know anything about calculus versus arithmetic or geometry or something, calculus is a form of mathematics that studies rates of change. It studies things that are variable, that are changing over time. You know, if you drop a ball from an airplane, it falls and hits the ground, you, that's static. Statics is what they call it. You can measure it's the same every time. But what about if you throw the ball from the airplane sideways and then it has to curve and come down and you can throw it at different speeds, different levels of intensity. Then you have all these variables and how long it takes to hit the ground. That's calculus. Extremely complicated. Beautiful. I love calculus. It's a beautiful form of mathematics. But it's, it's wow, is it ever complicated. It's not... You can't take into consideration every possible different change and rate of change when you're dealing with independent human beings. 7.6 billion of them. It can't be done, folks. It can't be done. When I told you about the guitar models, I told you that even if they try to model a resistor, they can't. They have to stop. They have to draw the line somewhere. You can't go try to model, well, this resistor has this amount of impurities, and this resistor has this amount of impurities, and it has this effect on how well the resistor works. You can't do it. There's too many possibilities. With those models, they just stop trying. With these models, they don't even go that far, if you can believe it. They don't even go as far as the guitar modeling ones do. You know, and yet this is exactly, precisely what they claim to model. They claim to model human behavior. That's the whole point of these computer models. They're trying to say how the disease is going to spread. Well, they can't do that if they don't even understand how people are interacting with each other. And yet, as I just explained, they have absolutely no idea how people are interacting with each other. And they can't know. People are different. People do different things, they think differently, they react and respond differently. Now, in their own minds, they might think that it's about helping other people, but look at these Minnesotans who leave these Twitter comments. They honestly, in their twisted minds, think that they're the good guys. Everything they're doing is wrong. It's morally wrong, it's rationally wrong, logically wrong. It's not founded on any kind of valid or credible basis at all. They're out there calling people names and accusing people of being murderers just because they went out to a protest to stand up for their constitutional rights. And yet they think they're doing the right thing. It's the same thing with the people who make these computer models. They run the gamut from total self-interest to people who are just delusional. And this is the problem, folks. We have to face the reality of the world we live in. People do die. Sicknesses do happen. It's sad. But the best we can do is try to live our lives so that they have meaning while we're here. Not hold up in a prison, this prison or your home. 
and then each generation tries to add to the collective knowledge to improve things for others, which we cannot do with a stay-at-home order because we lose all of the data that we need to know how this virus works because we've upset the natural course of events. That's junk science, folks. That is absolute junk science. And the idea that we are allowing unelected CDC officials and epidemiologists to take control over public policy, even to the point of micromanaging people's lives to the point where if you go out on a paddle boat on the open ocean, you get arrested. Or if you step, like in England, if you step outside into your own backyard, just be in your backyard, you get fined about a thousand dollars. I'm sorry, folks. Something is dreadfully wrong here. You know it in your heart. You know it. And this video explains what the problem is. And I think it explains it better than anything you're getting on television or NPR or anywhere else. I ask you to spread these videos to other people so that they can benefit from that as well. I put a whole lot of work into this with no benefit to me. Nobody's paying me to do it. I'm paying to do it. <clears throat> For the sake of all these people, please spread the word about these videos so that we can get the word out of what is really going on here. This can have a devastating effect that I don't even want to go there. What I'm going to end with instead is I'm going to end up right where I began, the very ending of my first video on junk science. Once again, I'm going to ask President Eisenhower to take us out. In his farewell address to the United States of America, he was the supreme allied commander in World War II. He was President of the United States and yet when he left office and left public service the thing he wanted Americans to know was what? The most important thing he had to tell them was to watch out for junk scientists. And I quote, public policy itself could become the captive of a scientific technological elite. I'm gonna let President, I'm gonna take that section of his speech out and let President Eisenhower take this out. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I sure hope this helped you understand what's really going on out there. There is a real virus. It is dangerous to the extent that it is, but it's not something you need to fear. It's not something you need to give up your life for before that thing even has a chance to take your life from you. Don't give it up voluntarily. Fight for your life. Not to stay alive, but for your life. They're two different things. Because we're all going to die. And the question is, how are we going to live? And folks, this is no way to live. I'm so grateful to you for watching. Let everyone else know about this. Take it away, Ike. Kin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. It is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system, 
ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society.